Good morning. Welcome again to Anthem. My name is Linda Mendez. I'm the pastor of Outreach here at our church. We are so happy you're here this morning here at Anthem and at Loma Linda University Church. We want to make sure that you feel this is your home, that this can be a safe place for you, and that here, as you sit, as you praise, as you worship, you can find community, but most importantly, you can find Christ. So this morning, we wanna welcome you. If this is your first time here at Anthem or your first time at church, we wanna make sure that you feel seen, that you feel welcomed this morning. So we're gonna ask you, if this is your first time here, to take your phone out and that you text 55498 and that you say you are a first time comer. And we have something very special for you outside at our discipleship desk. We wanna make sure that we give you just a little gift to say welcome to Anthem. So make sure you text 55498, and at the end of the service, you go out and you claim your gift. We also want to invite you to participate in a very important part of worship, and that is our offerings. Our offerings go to support everything that we do here, but also other community programs that we have. And so this is the opportunity where you can worship with us. So our ushers are going to pass some baskets where you can deposit any cash you might have in your pockets. That's your time to do it now. And if you don't have any cash, we are prepared for that. We want you to text 55498, Anthem. Text Anthem to 445498, and you can give there. And that is your way to become involved. We want to invite you, Easter is right around the corner. We want to celebrate the awesome gift that God gave us and that is sending his son. And so we are having an Easter program that Friday night and it will be in our main sanctuary. We want to make sure that you come, but that you bring someone that has never been to church or that someone that has stopped going to church, make sure you invite them to come to that program on Friday night. And on Saturday, we will be here at Anthem for our normal services. And our last announcement this morning is you've been hearing about our Kenya mission trip. And if you haven't, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about it. $3,600, that covers your flight, your visa, travel insurance, food, lodge, um, and a two day safari. So what we will be doing in Kenya is working with some schools doing VBS. We will also be hosting eye clinics and doing a little bit of construction. So if mission trips is something that you've had on your mind, this is your time to go to this mission trip because of the safari and the things that you will experience. I felt like as I was out there watching lions and zebras and giraffes, that this was the closest I could experience heaven on earth. And I just imagine how wonderful it will be when we get to heaven and I don't have to be in a car protected. But I want you to think about going to Kenya and if you want more information, you can visit yourechlluc.com. We are entering a new series soon called Shabbat Shalom that Pastor Randy will be bringing to us. And if you've ever felt like you're trying to do everything possible to feel good and to get right with God, but somehow you're just feeling like you're always coming short and you're feeling a little bit exhausted about that, Pastor Randy's going to share how Shabbat Shalom can bring us some peace and some hope. So we encourage you guys to join us for that. And as we move into the last sermon of our series here, we wanna encourage you to take your Bibles out, take your pens, your notebooks, whatever it is, so that you can be fully present in the service this morning as we hear Pastor Randy bring the word. But most importantly, we ask you to open your hearts so that God can work through him today. morning, Anthem. Good to see you all here this morning. Love having you here. I love this day. I love this weather. If I lived in Portland, I wouldn't say that, but in Southern California, I love this weather. It's great to be with you. 
worshiping God together. So years ago, I was teaching a class at this university when a student asked me the question, how is it that you seek to order your life by a book that was written 2,000, 3,000 years ago? A book that has nothing in it of the modern world, that doesn't match what you do in your life. How do you do that? Now, it wasn't a confrontational question. It wasn't an angry question. It wasn't a, I'm going to put the professor on the spot question. It was literally a question of bewilderment. How is it that you do that? Does it have anything to do with us today? Now, while the student didn't say so, I suspect that they were thinking primarily of two realities. And those two realities, there would be others as well, but those two realities would be culture and time. The culture is different. The time is different. It doesn't have anything to do with us. How do you think about such things? So we've been trying to do that some throughout this series. Today, I want to take one more step in that direction. I want to suggest to you that the student's question. Indeed, all of these realities might be helpfully addressed by a concept that theologians talk about that is the concept of progressive revelation. What progressive revelation simply means is that God reveals himself over time in a progressive way so that as God's people walk with God throughout time, they come to greater and deeper understandings of who God is. Now, this might help us address some of the really troublesome passages, especially in the Old Testament. So as you know, we've been basing our series in the Gospel of Luke, and in a moment I want to read to you from the Gospel of Luke. But before we read Luke, I actually want to read another text deep in the Old Testament to set the stage for what Jesus will say in Luke's gospel. So we go all the way back to Leviticus, to the Levitical codes, those codes that if you've ever read through them, you're th saying, what? That makes no sense whatsoever. We're going back into that section because our text, our passage in Luke's gospel has to do with love, love for others. And this is the time, the most clear time it is named in the Old Testament. So we want to start with the earlier revelation God had. Leviticus chapter 19 and one verse, verse 18 says this, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Okay. So at the core, this passage has to do with love and with the love of others, correct? It says, love your neighbor as yourself. But I want you to notice something particularly important, and that is that there's a limitation placed around this. It says, love those among your people. So if we were speaking in the world of the church, in today's world, it would be as though God is saying, love each other at Anthem. Out there, that's a whole different ballgame. But love each other at Anthem. And then he defines what that means. Don't hold a grudge. Don't walk in here hating on somebody. And don't seek revenge. Don't stand over in the corner and say, he's right over there. Yeah, that guy is. And then start doing that. Don't do that, he says. Love others. But it has some limitations around it. What is curiously lacking here is any sense of a love for enemies. I want to read to you the words of New Testament scholar Craig Keener. He's commenting on this passage. Brief comment, but notice what he says. The Old Testament specifically commanded the love of neighbor, and then it gives the text we just read, but neither it, that is the Old Testament, neither it nor Jewish sages commanded love of enemies, although many taught non-retaliation and insisted on leaving vengeance to God. So that's the stage. That's the first command. That's the most clear articulation in the Old Testament of this command to love others. The New Testament will build on it later. But when it starts out, that's what it is. Now with that in mind, with that kind of echoing in our ears, I want to take you to Luke's gospel, 
to the passage for today. These will be the words of Jesus. in the. It's called in Luke the Sermon on the Plain. I want you to listen to what he says. Now bear in mind what Leviticus said as we're reading this. Now listen to Jesus. Luke 6, verse 27. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies. Do good to them and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Wow. That's a whole different ballgame than Leviticus. I want to point out several ways. First of all, we have to admit, it still has to do with this theme, right? Right? It's still talking about love. Leviticus was talking about love for others, although that was clearly limited. Jesus is here addressing love to others in a much more expansive way. It has in here what Leviticus gives no hint of, and that's love your enemies. But there are a couple of other ways in which this is particularly different from what we led, read pardon me, in Leviticus. One is that the standard is very different, and two is that the content is very different. So what do I mean by the standard? In Leviticus, the standard of love was self-love, right? Because it says, love your neighbor as... One of you's awake. <laughs> love your neighbor as yourself. Exactly. That's the standard. In the way you pay attention to your own needs, your desires, your sorrows, your hopes, your dreams, be attentive to others as well. That's the standard. Self-love. However, when we come to Luke, the standard is nothing other than God. God is kind to the evil and God is kind to the good. God does things regardless of how good or bad you are. Does those for your benefit. Be merciful as your Father is merciful. That's a whole different standard. Suddenly the standard just got elevated infinitely high. That's one. But the second way in which it is different is in the content. Because you notice Leviticus said, don't hold a grudge and don't get revenge. Now, it doesn't take much time in the New Testament to realize the New Testament, pardon me, in the Old Testament, to realize the Old Testament world was an angry, vindictive, violent world. A world when you got hit, you hit back, and you hit back hard. In that setting, God's command is, don't hold a grudge and don't get revenge. In other words, we could say that the content is characterized by the word restraint. Restraint. Restrain yourself. Don't strike back. I don't care if she hits you first. Don't hit her. Don't hit her back. You're older. You should know better. Well, you know the whole, whole thing. What the parent is saying is practice some restraint. Don't strike back. That's what God is saying in Leviticus. Now, you come to the content in Luke, and what is Jesus saying? This was just to remind you, the first two verses of the passage we read. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. What Jesus is saying is, if you're going to love in the way I'm asking you to love, it will require action. You will have to do something. 
Instead of just restraining from hitting your sister back, you will go over and put your arms around her and say, I love you. And you will resist the urge to whisper under your breath, you do that to me again, I'll kill you. <laughs> you know? Jesus is saying, you will take action. You will love. You will bless. You will care for. Once again, that is light years from where this is. Now, if we just read this passage in Luke's gospel, it is easy to miss the fact that it is a stellar example of progressive revelation. In other words, had we stopped reading at Leviticus, our understanding of God would have been compromised. But because God takes his time revealing himself to and leading his people at a pace they can manage, if we stay with him, that progressive revelation becomes more and more clear about who he is and honestly, more and more demanding of us. So, this is revelation. How are we to understand all this? Because there, there are some stories in there, especially in the Old Testament, that will scald the hair off a dog. It's like, what in the world is that about? What is that doing in the Bible? I don't understand that. So Alden Thompson up at Walla Walla University, some of you may have had him as a professor. If you happen to attend Walla Walla study there, you may have had him in class. You may remember that Alden Thompson had something that he called the one, the two, the ten, and the many. It was his way of describing what the Bible is all about. If asked, what is the Bible about? Thompson would say, I can answer that in one word. The one word is love. The entire scripture is about that one word, love. You say, well... All right, that's a nice thought. What does that mean? All right, now I have the two, he says. You look at Jesus when asked what's the most important commandment, he said, love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love others. That's now breaking down what Scripture is. Okay, I get that. So love is what it's all about. That's the one word. But there are two other thoughts that will enflesh that, incarnate that, love for God, love for others. But what does that mean? How am I supposed to understand that? I said, okay. Well, Moses gives us in the Hebrew, it's actually called the Ten Words. We know it as the Ten Commandments, in which the first four expound on what it means to love God. The last six expound on what it means to love others. So now we're getting more and more expl explanations. We're saying, okay. I, 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 I but even then you say, I, I don't fully have every answer I need from that either. So he says, all right, fine. I'll just tell you then, there are many. Just take and read the entire Bible. Make it your study. There are many examples, many answers, many issues there. So that's what you need to do if you want to understand. But through it all, just know this. It is ultimately about love. That's the core. Now, I love Thompson's scheme. But I also recognize its challenges. Because I open this book, occasionally in the New Testament, but especially in the Old Testament, and say, there are stories in here. <laughs> you tell me that's about love? I don't understand that. Well, maybe that's where progressive revelation will help us understand it. Because God, throughout Scripture, and even in our lives, takes us a step at a time at a rate we can negotiate. And that hasn't even stopped now. I want to read you just a verse and a half from John's gospel. This is right at the heart of the conversation Jesus had with his disciples the last night before his crucifixion. It goes on for about five or six chapters. The most intimate you ever see Jesus being. He is literally opening his heart, sharing intimately of himself with the disciples. 
He's looking at these disciples who have followed him. They must at this point be bedraggled and frightened. They can sense in the city of Jerusalem the anti-Jesus sentiment is building. It's about to burst on them with a cloud of fury. He looks at those disciples in the condition they're in, in the middle of his sharing intimately with them. And then he says something that I just find utterly stunning. This is what he says. John 16, 12. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. Now just think about that. He's saying there's so much I want to tell you, so much I want to reveal to you. But you're not ready. Not yet. So I'm going to withhold that. That's stunning to me. It calls to mind the, the concept of William Webb. He was here two or three weeks ago. He very briefly mentioned this. I want to elaborate on it. It's, this is my take on it, so don't blame him. But think of a football field. If you happen to be uninitiated in football, you're a novice, I'll just say this. If you have the ball here, your goal is to move here to this goal line, cross that goal line with the ball, and then you score. And every time you cross the goal line, you score. At the end of the game, whoever's crossed it more wins. What if that is progressive, re progressive revelation in the economy of God? So what is the goal line? The goal line is a mature, other-centered love. Love for God and love for others. That's the ultimate ethic God is calling us to. That's what he desires his people to experience and express. There is where he is taking us. But God realizes that his people are starting all the way back here on the two-yard line. They're coming out of Egypt. Centuries of, of misunderstanding of God, of paganism, of worshiping the Egyptian gods. They don't understand. So God says, all right. We're starting here. I'm going to move you in that direction. If I give you everything right now, you'll never be able to take it. It will overwhelm you, and we will get nowhere. So it's going to be like football of 100 years ago, three yards in a cloud of dust, one yard in a cloud of dust, two yards in a cloud of dust, just a little bit of movement incrementally. But we're moving in this direction, but we're sensitive to and starting where you are. You with me? So here's an example of that. When, when William Webb was here, he mentioned this. You may remember this. In the world of the ancient Near East, A&E, ancient Near East, A&E warfare was brutal. And it can be summarized in three words, Webb told us. Battle, build, brag. So what you did is you went to war with your enemies. You defeated them, assuming you defeated them. You went home and you built a temple to your God or you refurbished the temple to your God. And in doing so, you bragged about your exploits. You put it in the iconography on the temple, the artwork on the walls, Archaeologists have many pictures. You can go online and look at them of the bragging that went on in the A&E world about what we did to them. It is horrific in the extreme. It's people being impaled while they're alive. It's people being skinned alive. It's people private being cut off from them and piled in, in mounds. This was A&E warfare. It was how you bragged about it. That's the world in which these people lived. What about God? Do you know that in the Old Testament, you have God weeping, weeping for his enemies? There is not one, not one example has been found of an A&E God doing that. Only the God of the Old Testament weeping for his enemies. That God said, in my temple... There will be no iconography, no artwork like that. On the, what there will be is there will be palm trees and pomegranates and garden scenes in my temple. And then he said to David,
David, the man after God's own heart. David, the man of warfare and battle. David, who wanted to build a temple for God. God said, no, you're not building a temple for me. I will not trust that you will be able to resist that temptation to brag. You will not build it. The one who will build it will be your son named Solomon, whose name means peaceable. That's who will build it. And you have three yards and a cloud of dust. That if you look at it from our perspective, it looks horrible. You look at it from that world, you say, God is moving them, moving them in a direction. What about Zelophehad's daughters? You can look up the spelling later. Zelophehad had five daughters, no sons. In a patriarchal world where men inherited, not women. And Zelophehad's daughters came to Moses and said, we don't have any brothers. This isn't fair. Moses says, you know what? You got a point. Let me talk to God about it. He comes back and says, here's what God said. Change the law. They're right. They deserve to inherit. And just like that, three more yards and a cloud of dust. That from our perspective looks archaic, but it wasn't written in our time. A movement toward egalitarianism, equality. Or take punishment in the ancient law courts. Punishment was swift, severe, and overwhelming. Destroyed people. Horrible. And God comes along and says, no, 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 no. When you punish, it will be just. The punishment must meet the crime. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth. It must match. And again... We have another movement, three yards in the cloud of dust, still moving in the direction of a mature love for God and for others. And we just keep slowly moving down the field. At times in fits and stalls, at times we get sacked and go backwards, at times we get two or three yards. But God's insistent movement at a rate that people can manage keeps moving them in the direction of a more mature love. Then you know what happens? Suddenly there's a pass play, a long pass play, and the ball lands in a little village called Bethlehem. Amen. And suddenly there is a dramatic leap forward. And that little baby will grow up to be a man who says this. You have heard that it was said, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. I say to you, forgive, love. Suddenly we're beginning to understand this progressive revelation that keeps moving us forward. And then that now adult, born in Bethlehem, it's as though he grabs the ball and he plunges over the goal line with the ball in his hand and he spikes it, thus creating a place where a cross grows up and stands as the everlasting testimony, the everlasting witness to the fact that God is a God of love, that this is where he's been taking us the entire time. This is the ultimate and sublime expression of that. My beard is gray, but I'm still learning. One of the things I've been learning, thank you so much, one of the things I've been learning in recent times, last year or two, I've kind of immersed myself in this world and trying to understand that. And I've come to realize that some of the most awful stories here in the Old Testament, when you set them against the backdrop of the world of that day, you end up saying, my, 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 look at what God's doing. In a sewer of what is happening, he's saying, this is not okay. I know you can't negotiate it all right now, but I am going to inexorably move you in this direction. Continually move you there. And here's the other thing that I've been learning. I've been learning that what God does historically, God also does personally. Because just as he took the people where they were and a little bit, a play at a time, a run at a time, a sack, a pass at a time, kept moving them in the direction of his ultimate ethic, just as he did that in the revelation of this word, 
He does the exact same thing in my life as a disciple. He takes me where I am. And a bit at a time just keeps moving me down the field. As I come to understand more and more of his revelation. And how it is that love is at the core of that. That's a most important insight for us here at Anthem. It is because our purpose here at Anthem is growing disciples. We're not encouraging you to read scripture so you can become a Bible scholar or so that you can win at Bible trivia. That's not our purpose. Our purpose in saying get into this book is so that you can understand God and so that God's spirit can form you can grow you as a disciple as he moves you in the direction of his ultimate ethic and his ultimate goal. That's our purpose. So in the late first century, early second century A.D., there was a Jewish sage, a Jewish scholar named Rabbi Akiva. Stories told of Rabbi Akiva one day being out with his flocks and as he was walking through that desert area, he came to a place where there was a sudden chasm. He noticed a little stream running toward the chasm. Out of curiosity, he walked over and looked down. On the, on the bottom part of the chasm was a large boulder. This little stream was a small stream, so that it didn't really run over. It just dripped over, dripped over. Rabbi Akiva is said to have stood there looking at that boulder and realizing that on that huge boulder, that constant drip, drip, drip of the water had actually created a groove in the boulder, had actually changed the boulder. And Akiva said, it, 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 it struck me that if there had been a flash flood and a torrent of water had poured over that edge and engulfed that boulder, that it would soon all have washed away and would have made no difference in the boulder. And Akiva said, It was then that I thought about the word of God in my own heart and life. And realized if God had just poured out his revelation on me in its fullness right from the beginning, it would have overwhelmed me, washed away, and I would have been no different. That's not what he did. He continues, said Akiva, to drip his word into my life. One drip, one day, one week, one year at a time. And over time, the dripping of God's word in my life, said Akiva, is changing my heart. The contemporary, the modern author, Lois Verberg, commenting on that scene with Rabbi Akiva says this, when I first started studying the Bible's Hebraic context, I wanted one commentary that would teach me everything, one class that would explain it all. If I could learn all the right answers in one marathon event, all the better. But I find now that God likes to reveal his truth over many years as I study alongside others. Not just historically, but personally. I realize now that big splashes are not God's usual way of doing things. Instead, the slow drip of study and prayer day after day, year after year, is how he shapes us into who he wants us to be. That's what we're about in this place. As we are shaped into what God wants us to be, everything else follows. Loving others, serving others, making a difference in the world, having healthy personal relationships. It all grows out of that. But just as God revealed himself progressively over time in your life, he will reveal himself progressively to you. One of the great joys of my life and I'm not a spring chicken, is continuing to learn every morning from Scripture. Continue to say, God, form me in the way you desire me to be formed. Take the failures, the mess-ups that I way too often commit and cover them with your grace and then just keep handing me 
the ball by your grace to go one more yard down the field. Thank you for your grace as it continues to drip into my life. So that's the invitation to you. That's why we're studying this understandable series. So not you can win contests and quote script. No, that's fine. But what we're looking for is the change of heart that will grow you as a disciple as God continues to reveal himself to you. So God bless you as the word drips into your life. Thank you.